Brine Grubs, More Tooth Maggots, Get Glycera, Bastard Bloodworms, an enemy that was introduced to us in the Fallout 4 expansion, Nuka World. For many, it scared the bejesus out of us as we wandered through the ramshackle remains of Dry Rock Gulch, exploding from the earth like fleshy landmines. Like all creatures in Fallout, they have both the roots in the real world, pop culture, and even in cryptozoology, in this case. They are also quite unique in behaviour, reproduction, and just their overall appearance, something I am sure many of you have overlooked, if for no other reason than you were trying to kill them. So today, I will seek to explain and expand on all of this, and hopefully answer some of your questions on these creatures. Let's gander. So first off, the look. They are about a meter and a half in length, though that seems to vary a bit between their larva stage and the adult stage. Their body consists of the head and the tail, which are also the only two targetable sections of the bloodworm in vats. The tail is highly flexible and mobile, likely to assist them in their movement of their mass. It also elongates and contracts, which is what is responsible for most of their movement. What their bodies actually use for traction and to pull themselves along are likely the spikes that cover their bodies. These are probably parapodia, which are also found in their real world counterparts. The tail itself has to be quite muscular, due to both their overground and subterranean movements. Above ground, they are able to launch themselves large distances to cover the distance between themselves and their prey, mainly us Sam, unfortunately. However, the main reason for this strength is their ability to move through the ground at high speeds, rivaling that of mole rats and rad scorpions, and breaching the ground in a similar fashion as the latter. The height to which they can propel themselves coming out of the ground or moving back in is impressive, though glitches to occur at a time, launching the wee shits far into orbit. <laughs> the dome of the bloodworm is one of the most interesting characteristics. The head is composed of four beak-like jaws that seem to have fleshy serrations on the outside. The reason for this funnel, or ridge shape, is likely to do with how they move through the dirt. Now I have to apologise here, as I wasn't able to find any concrete answers on this. Anyone who knows more, or is an expert in these matters, please comment below to correct me if I'm wrong. I'm assuming they do not eat the material through which they burrow, at least in the case of rocks and sand, and so the shape of the head is to dig into the soil or the dirt, and funnel it up and over themselves, letting their tail and the spikes push and pull them along. The mouth opens up into a toothed maw, with a lining of each jaw coated in teeth, or at least what appear to be teeth. These are used to latch onto their prey, with the shape of the jaws and their size ensuring that they cannot get away. Now how they hunt is actually quite interesting, as for the most part they will remain underground, and then come up to attack. Now since they don't seem to have eyes, and as such are visually blind, their method of detection is probably related to vibrations. As prey gets closer, they can use the movements and vibrations they cause to pinpoint their location, and then emerge from the earth to sink their teeth into said prey's arse. Now on to where they came from and their means of reproduction. They are largest in number in Dry Rock Gulch, and in my opinion, that is no accident. If we take a look at the real world counterpart, on which they are partly based, we see why. Glycera, commonly known as bloodworms, are very good at burrowing, and are usually found in sand or silt-like regions. Now the surrounding area of Nuka World contains plenty of sand or silty areas, due to the streams and lakes present throughout it, which explains why they can be found outside the gulch. However, the gulch itself has been designed to look like a wild west town, and this includes the presence of loose sand and earth in much of it, providing them with the ideal terrain to hunt in. So spoilers ahead for anyone who has yet to clear Dry Rock Gulch. We are tasked with clearing out the Queen, the source of the bloodborne infestation inside Dry Rock Gulch. The fact that it chose to set up inside a mineshaft-like area is another piece of evidence of how optimum Dry Rock Gulch was for the bloodworms. The fact that there is a queen explains the presence of the larva, as they are likely laying as eggs, and then hatch when they have matured enough. Now if you have been in here, then you have seen the brahmin, or more accurately, their pleasant, pulsating remains. It seems the queen doesn't lay that many eggs at once, as there are only a few to a single brahmin, likely because of their size. Brahmins may have been killed, or possibly rendered immobile, and the larva is laid inside them. From there, they likely get their nutrients and energy from the Brahmin itself, consuming it as they grow and mature, and I really hope it wasn't alive when this happens. The movements on the surface of the Brahmin are either the larva moving within it, or perhaps expel gas causing swelling. The larvae still retain the ability to attack their prey as they explode out of the Brahmin as we approach, 
Oddly enough, if we attack the Brahmin, they're left stunned momentarily before they respond. This suggests that they are not used to life outside of the Brahmin, and it takes a few moments for their instincts to kick in. Yet they're perfectly fine when they decide to be assholes and attack us. Weird. Also present are the venomous variation of the Bloodworm. As the name suggests, it bees a venomous fucker. This is also present in its real world counterpart. Well, sort of. Venom is injected into the wound, like in this case. According to Wikipedia, the bloodworm is poisonous, yet it's administered in the bite. So either I am misunderstanding the difference between poison and venom, which I do not think I am, or that Wikipedia article is wrong. Like, seriously, someone check that and get back to me. Their meat can also be eaten. Now it's interesting as it provides you with radiation resistance. This could explain why the bloodworms have survived as long as they have. Due to the radiation resistance present in the bloodworms, they survived the nuclear holocaust, and the presence of radiation caused them to grow in size, somehow. Now I won't start on FEV, okay? The lore behind that is a shit show of whether it's responsible for all mutations, or just some. So I will let you decide if, in this particular instance, it's responsible. Like many species now, there's also a glowing one present in their ranks. Now this is likely due to the buildup of radioactive material in their bodies, but that is for another video. In this instance, it could be caused due to the radioactive content of the soil that they move through, but for the overall cause in many species, we shall take a look at that in another video. Now as for their pop culture reference, I'm sure you've all figured that out. They are a reference to the Graboid, the species of worm present in Tremors, which I have yet to watch, unfortunately. If you actually take a look, they are quite similar, from the four jaws, the beaks forming the maw to the manner in which they track, hunt and kill their prey. It's always interesting to see how Bethesda will draw from popular culture, and this time was no exception. I expect another creature they were based on is the Mongolian deathworm, a worm that can grow to over a meter in length, and can either spit acid, or it can kill with an electrical charge. The reason for the confusion of whether it does one or the other is that this creature is a cryptid. It's not confirmed to actually exist, as a specimen has never been found, nor has an accurate photo ever been taken. Now, you can look it up to get the full scoop on this creepy fucker, I encourage you to do so. But the reason for the similarities may be because the Graboid from Tremors was also likely based on this creature, and the Bloodworms were definitely based on the Graboids. The last part I want to talk about is their overall possible impact to the East Coast. The West Coast has their own form of subterranean creatures unveiled in the DLC, the Tunneler. However, it is referenced as a more dangerous creature on the whole, as the video I did on them states. They are expected to spread across the Mojave, like a plague. These worms, however, uh, well, they too have a queen, but their population on a whole seems to be lower than the Tunnelers, and it seems they require a host to reproduce, which limits how far they can spread. Also, they do a lot less damage. We also don't know how common a queen is, or where the queen comes from, which means that if one dies, like the one we killed, how does the species continue, if they are, for the moment, confined in Nuka World? Also, no one really talks about them as a real threat, which suggests that the threat they do pose is a manageable one. So these were the Bloodworms, named so for the haemoglobin showing up in their skin due to its transparent nature, or at least the real ones are. Due to the thick hide they seem to have now, maybe not so accurate anymore. First encountered in Nuka World, terrorizing some poor protectrons, these creatures join the rank of subterranean shitlords in the Fallout series. We have seen how their body shape allows them to move, and their mouth is used to attack prey. They are likely inspired by the Graboids from Tremors, and possibly the Mongolian Deathworm, which I encourage you to look up. All in all, they make a decent addition to Fallout, and perhaps in the future, if we ever get more DLC, or even in future games, come on Fallout Yarlings, we shall see them again. For now, we can only deal with the bastards in Nuka World, and laugh at how they flap about like sausages when we kill them. The first worm enemies of Fallout 4, and all the info I could get on them. I hoped you liked this look at all of it. If you did like it, give the video a like, and if you want regular updates, subscribe. Any suggestions for lore or future videos should be left in the comments below. Better yet, go onto my subreddit so we can discuss them in more detail. It's linked in the description. If you wish to, you can support me on Patreon. A pound or a dollar, I ask for no more. Any rewards that you would like to see there that I don't have, 
message me and I will take a look. Follow me on Twitter or Facebook to get regular updates or have a wee chat. Any business you wish to discuss, email me at anthapple.business at gmail.com and I will get back to you as soon as possible. I hope you enjoyed the episode and I hope to see you in the next one. And until then, goodbye.